Jordan. I, uh, do you have the, uh, I'm gonna drop a clicker right behind you. Yeah, I'm gonna try this. So, uh, my understanding of tonight was that it was to plant a few seeds so that when we have dinner and we're talking about it, that we can kind of say, okay, what comes up? How can we apply? Is there something relevant to our business or what we're seeing out there uh, in the market? And, uh, and, and the topic tonight is looking at technology and looking at the, the disruptive aspects of it and, uh, and looking at, as Thornton said, you know, when you look at the technology and you look at the innovation, um, what does it mean economically or from a, from a business or from a society and then how do you really incorporate it? And when, uh, when we're going through my intro, I, I have to confess, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a physicist by training, but I'm an applied physicist. And I went into applied physics for a reason. It's because I'm, I'm a terrible theoretical physicist, mm -hmm. but I was really looking for how do you apply technology to an outcome? How do you create an outcome? How do you work from an outcome backwards and based on an outcome, how can you use it to change something? And so I started life um, <clears throat> actually uh, in a kind of little esoteric part of, uh, of uh, technology and analytics called uh, MPP or Massively Parallel Processing. And uh, you know, there were companies, I, I was uh, uh, in IBM uh, down in New York, but there were companies up here like Thinking Machine and Cray who were constantly looking at how do you use information, how do you take that information, how do you aggregate the information to do what? To make a decision, to find something, to look at data, which is structured, unstructured, to be able to pull something from that information so that you can take a decision and make an action, not just look at a graph, not just look at a chart, but you had to do it. Some people were able to incorporate the analytics so they, they could drive a business decision. And the people that I gravitated to were in the financial services industry. And the first clients that I got at IBM who could use the information, who saw the power of data, were in the credit card industry. Because when I joined the credit card industry, which was a long time ago, you would go in and you would fill out an application to get a credit card. Now maybe people here in the room don't remember that, but it was called Take One. There was a paper-based application used to put your name down, you know, what your job is. Did you rent? Did you own? Right? And there was a few you know, like, like different data elements, and then you would mail that in, and then 45 days later, you may or may not get a credit card in the mail. You could get somebody who came back and said, you know, <clears throat> it's really interesting. Um, I looked at this stuff, but you're not going to get a credit card. Or you're going to get a credit card, and this is your open to buy. It was a 45-day process. The first innovation that I did in this industry was take 45 days down to seven seconds. It was at the point of sale. The minute that happened at the point of sale, the consumer who was sitting there saying, hey, could I do this, could I not? Oh, wait a second, can you just give me you know, three pieces of information? We needed your name and validation of your zip, and there was one other piece of information. And we could go and pop out to get a bureau, come back with a pre-approved authorization. Now, we didn't have to give you a huge open to buy, we just had to give you enough to get that purchase, right? 45 days down to seven seconds, right? Once that happened, that started transforming the credit card industry. Then you had a few people who knew how to use data, right? By the way, the people who in this world know how to use data, they're usually like sitting kind of in the back room, just sitting back there, kind of a little shy. <clears throat> they're not forthright, they're not coming out, they're not sitting there and saying, wait a second, how do I make the decision? And there was one, client that we had who said, I'm going to build a company, a credit card issuer, based on data, based on analytics. Now, is anybody here, well, I, I, I should get there in a second, but let me ask this question. Anybody here familiar with the insurance industry? Insurance industry, insurance industry, insurance industry, right? <clears throat> okay, insurance industry with analytics mm -hmm. is 20 years behind credit card industry, at the, at the best case, at the best case. Because when you look at the credit card industry, you look at what Capital One was able to build with uh, using analytics. As they started getting into analytics, what were they able to do? They were able to transform the ability to make a decision down actually to an individual level. They were able to champion, challenger, and test the ability to uh, determine the effectiveness of a marketing campaign. They were thrilled if they could get what's called lift, which is a response from a campaign, and instead of being you know, this stinky in the industry, 2.5%, if they could get 6%, they were thrilled. <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example. 
today that is going to put that and show you a different way of thinking about how to use data that trumps that type of results. What happened with CAC 1, if you look at the credit card industry, the credit card industry is completely consolidated. If you look at what drove the people who consolidated, it was the ability to do two things. One, analytics, two core systems. Because if you could do the analytics and you could figure out who the individuals were you did a target, then it demanded that you would address the core systems. If you can change your core systems, you can take 45 days down to seven seconds. If you could take um, the ability to have a segment of two <laughs> down to a segment of n, right? You had to change your core systems because you had to leverage a disruptive technology. So today, a little bit interactive, it's about looking at <coughs> disruptive technologies that are happening today and how they're going to affect the business. So let me just mention a little bit about who we are. <coughs> We're Return and Intelligence. So Return and Intelligence is a firm put together by uh, Gordon, Alan and myself with uh, Dave Carpini. Dave Carpini, <coughs> um, uh, we're a little bit over 18 months old. We're about 1,400 people. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, and, and Doug Brockway, we're about 1,400 people. We're based outside of Philadelphia. Um, we've got uh, operations, about 200 people in the US. We've got um, 900 people in Russia, Eastern Europe. And we have about 300 people in Asia. Because where we see the growth is globally, the things that we're going to talk about are just happening in the US, they're happening global. People are trying to understand how to leverage this disruption and where to take it in the world. Now, one thing I do have to say, like, I don't read this, right? Like, like, one thing I do have to say is that everything that I'm talking about today, in some ways, is um, th there's nothing cutting edge. Like, nothing that we're going to talk about is cutting edge, which is a little bit disappointing for me. Because I do love to look ahead and see what's happening 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years out. But everything that we're talking about here is present, is being used today, is being able to cause disruption today, and is somebody's competitive advantage today, and somebody's competitive disadvantage today. And that's amazing. That what we're seeing is being tried, experimented, used today, and there is incredible <clears throat> impact. So with that, I do have to bring in, I didn't realize that, that Thornton, you were a cultural anthropologist, right? So- Pete's working. Hmm? <laughs> Pete's working. <laughs> yeah, it Pete's working. So um, I, I do have to say that uh, our, part of our uh, logo is the, uh, is the R with the I. It gets back to a little bit like cultural anthropology, mm -hmm. but it's about storytelling. So uh, part of it was to draw an analogy to, if you go to India, the elephant and the good luck mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. trunk going up, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And it's also to evoke Ganesh. Mm -hmm. And I was thrilled, by the way, I, I guess I should say I'm a reformed physicist. I was thrilled to have a conversation with Brian tonight, who looked at it and said, oh my gosh, that's Ganesh, <laughs> the remover of obstacles. Because there is mythology in what we're doing today. There is mythology in what we're doing today. Because despite all the technology, always on, you know, having everything, like, has anyone gone to dinner? And by the way, no one here has done this. Gone to dinner, you look out and you see another, you know, table over there, and both people at the table yeah. are doing this? They don't talk. They don't talk. How, like, nasty is that? <laughs> but that's the new culture. That's well, your dinner party. Yeah, I mean, like, like, yeah, like, exactly. It, it, it depends. And I'm like thinking, wait a second, where, where is the concept of being connected in this world of being, being always connected on? Connected through the device. Right. And, 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 and people can say, I mean, I, I've got an 11 year old and a 16 year old, and it's going to come back up in this, in, this, uh, in this talk a few times. And one of the things which is amazing is, is I turned uh, to my two sons and I said, never say anything on your device that you wouldn't say face to face. Mm -hmm. And just do me a favor, just think twice. Because it's too easy to say something here that you would never, ever say to a person. You know, because at the end of the day, we're human, right? And so it's about the humanity. So this gets to the cultural anthropology. I don't think I've ever met a cultural anthropologist, but <laughs> now that I have, I'm scared. Okay, <laughs> so, so what are we talking about? Okay, so new and innovative technologies that drive customer-driven behavior. 
customer-driven behavior. You called it venal. At the end of the day, there is an action at the end of this. There is an outcome, right? If anybody here accesses their accounts via a mobile phone and your bank can't really handle it, let me guess, you're not going to be with them very long. All right? You're just not going to be there. If, by the way, when you go to access the information, you can't see it, you can't get to it, you know what I mean? It doesn't really interact with your device, you're not going to be there very long. Right? Because, because at the end of the day, we have to vote. All of us have to vote. And this is driving customer-driven business models. Now, one thing I do want to say is all technology doesn't work. Right? And there's a, there's a lot of technology out there that everyone thinks is going to be great, but it turns out not. Segway, there was a lot of fanfare. I remember when it was coming out, I was like, oh, you know, this cool thing. But at the end of the day, you get there and you say, oh my God, look at these people. Thank God that was never me <laughs> or my family or anyone <laughs> um, out there. So when we get there, there is some technology that is extraordinarily transformative and is driving something that happens at the customer level and at the cash register level. So the innovation here was what? This is like a time for a question. <laughs> iTunes. It was iTunes. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the device. Mm -hmm. No, there were already MP3 players already in the field at the time, but it was iTunes. And it's then layer DRM, it's, it's packaging with uh, vendors, and let them go around the peer to peer process. I actually love this man. Because, because you're, you're, you're sitting there, and and now you don't want to bring up the whole naked thing. So <laughs> I keep my phone on. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the important thing here was was everything at the store. It was about the store. The brilliance was the store, and how it changes things. So, so my my 16 year old son, I my, my wife wonders why I love to drive into school. I uh, you know like if I'm if I'm in town, I'm driving my my boys to school. And she's like, well, why do you like, love to do it? And I'm like, well, it's a few minutes in the car. Plus, my son always has found an interesting musician and band mm -hmm. that I never heard of. And I said, it's extraordinary. So he has found, he hunts on the internet to find obscure artists. And then the bet is, it's five bucks, if I can pull out Shazam, and if I can, and, 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 and if I can, and, and if I can say, and if, it, if, Shazam, if he said, hey, it's a new artist, if I Shazam it, and it, and it pops up, right? Everybody, everybody knows Shazam, right? It's the thing you, when you hear an artist, you can play, it says, oh yeah, that, that is Dr. Dre, right? Or if it doesn't find it, right? I owe him five, and if it does find it, he owes me five. So <clears throat> he's been doing this, but, the, but he hunts obscure musicians, by the way, who like have 400 downloads. It's, it, it, it's extraordinary. He, the, he's 16 years old, his music sophistication is like, you know, mid thirties. It's, it's like blowing me away. What I've been able to do, and it's fun because I see how he's developing tools and abilities and self motivation that's going to carry him forward as we go through. I also am looking at him because my clients, he will become their customer. And I want to see how he buys. I want to see how he processes data. <coughs> I want to see how he makes a decision. Right. So, cultural anthropology, yes. I'm watching my offspring, fruit of my loins, hoping that he's gonna do better than his dad and will take care of his dad when he gets older. <laughs> okay. So, there are a lot of stuff out, things are happening, things are changing. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google, uh, <clears throat> LinkedIn. Uh, one, of the, one of the cool things I'm saying with, uh, with my 11-year-old um, uh, and 16-year-old, my, my 16-year-old, they don't use Facebook anymore. Like, they will not go on Facebook, right? Because it's, they're afraid of the digital footprint. And they're like, you know, I don't want to do it. So they do Snapchat and they, and they do other stuff. They're on Twitter all the time. And they, it, it, it's amazing how quick it's changing. Facebook is a billion people. They're trying to figure out how to monetize it. There's a lot of implications of it. But just because there are a billion people and a huge market cap doesn't mean that it's going to be relevant you know, five or 10 years from now, right? They've got to create a sustainable business model. So, disruptive technologies transform life, business, global economy, and how we experience ourselves, maybe our family, or extended family, or community, business, the environment we, we, we work in, right? It's global phenomenon, it's a local phenomenon. 
But for us in here, how do we leverage that? How do we create meaning out of it? If you don't, a competitive advantage is a competitive disadvantage. Absolutely. Right? So, I remember 128. Uh, <clears throat> I went to high school in Boston. My parents still live here. I drive down, and it was, it was something comforting seeing the Polaroid factory. Like, I thought I'd be here forever. I, I happened to love photography. I just thought I would be here forever. And it was really kind of hard. I, and it was the first time I realized that um, adaptability is the ability to like deal with change. Like I didn't want to believe that Polaroid can go poof, or Arthur Anderson can go poof, or Enron can go poof, right? Or maybe Facebook's going to go poof, but it can't. And the velocity of change is greater than it's ever been, like like before it is. So if you don't adapt, who knows? The business might not be in business. Now, here's a great thing that I did learn. Look at the age of the CEO. Look at the age of the CEO of a company, and you will have a pretty good insight about, based on what's happening in their business, their propensity to make the changes necessary versus optimize their financial situation to facilitate a sale, because there's a direct correlation. So what didn't come out in the uh, bio is I have, <coughs> I, I'm fairly, fairly analytic. Um, I spent the last decade investing. So it is looking at what are the underlying drivers behind what's motivating M&A in certain sectors. And, and it's not always financial. It's partly looking at who's on the board, <laughs> who's the management team, and what's their ability to absorb and change as change is happening to them. Now, we talk about five flavors of change, which are disruptors, which are happening all today, which are creating a situation which requires that companies deal with the change or face consequences, financial consequences. We call that Internet of Everything, social, mobile, analytics and cloud, or iSmack. And the internet of, of, of everything we're, we're going to talk about, and, and one of the things we've done is, and again, I, I want to underscore this, because, <clears throat> because there, there are people who are great at looking ahead 50 years and saying what's going to happen in 50 years and pulling that into today. Here, there's nothing that you have to like. In this room, there's an example of everything. So this is today, right? This is not stuff which is coming. But it has to be dealt with today. And people are innovating incredibly quickly and iterating and iterating and trying and iterating and iterating to think about how this affects the business. And when Gordon, and Alan, and I, and Dave, and Doug, and when we said, OK, we want to get into this, we wanted to say, OK, we want to be the firm that helps people deal with this, uh, like these disruptive forces and create an environment and a pathway to make changes, not just in the front end, but all the way through into the core system. And the core system sometimes require heart surgery. And part of the reason I got into this was the day that I walked into an insurance carrier, and they had 22 duplicate systems that did what's called policy billing claims. They had 22 policy administration systems. I asked the guy, I said, 22? Are you mental? Like, <laughs> you know, how, can, how can you do that? How do you do it? He goes, well, you know, we grow through acquisition because we can't change a system to get into a new state. I'm like, what? He goes, oh, yeah. Insurance in the U.S. is state regulated. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, New York is very different than Massachusetts. And I'm like, like I come from financial services originally. I'm like, oh, that's mental. But then I remembered in the credit card industry when you, people were regulated in an individual state, and then Delaware said, I know, I'm going to create laws that are going to facilitate that you can do underwriting by centralizing. Mm -hmm. Same thing <coughs> happened in credit card. So I looked at this and I said, OK, you know, it's fascinating. You know, banks, insurance companies like property casualty, a lot of companies, pharmaceutical, they're all dealing with this type of uh, transformation. So I'm going to show you some videos that are small, like little, like two to three minute you know, like video clips they're going to hit ISMAC. So one concept is the Internet of Everything, which has be, is becoming popularized, but basically, has anyone seen anybody running around with a night fuel bag? 
-hmm. Like it's called the night fuel band. It's like they, they wear on the list, oh, this is how much you sleep. Mm -hmm. So you do it and it connects. Yeah, we actually rolled out Fitbits to all of our yeah. employees that'll track their sleep, their eating habits, all that's part of a healthy you initiative. Yeah. So that's part of the Internet of Things. It's, it's about connecting like a device to another device. It goes right into your iPhone or, you know, your Android. And then you can update your Facebook page and your friends could say, hey, how come you weren't sleeping last night? Right? You know, but, it, but it's capturing, and, and it, there's a level of interconnectivity. By the way, if there wasn't the technology investment that happened in 97, 98, 99, 2000, we, none of us would be here. Because that, even though there was the internet bubble and crash, it was actually an infrastructure. It was the roads, it was the infrastructure that had to be invested in or we couldn't do the things that we're doing. We actually overbuilt the fire. Uh, we, we, we overbuilt. Thought it was, we thought it was overbuilt. But, but, but it's extraordinary. Thank God for that, 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 that economic force that created it. Right? And if you look globally, by the way, I mean, you, you were saying that, that, that you, you go to the, the, in the Middle East. Like, thank heavens, they're not laying copper. <laughs> right? It's not about copper. It's about digital packets. It's about switches. It's about you know, creating that infrastructure that you can, you can communicate, you can get the information. You can get it sufficient capacity that you can run around with an iPhone and it's not going as it dials up, right? I was like, well, who makes that sound, right? You know, I, did anyone ever wonder why a motor made that sound? Is that like an odd sound? That's a really good imitation. It is, like, it is, it, it is a I'm I'm And I'm going, I'm going, down. I'm going, I'm going motor. for a second, yeah. for a second career. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so cool. let me try to do this thing. Enough. And I'm going to go and I'm going to start this video. <laughs> We're clicking the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> to hit enter. All waking up. Becoming part of the global phenomenon we call the Internet of Everything. Trees will talk to networks, will talk to scientists about climate change. Cars will talk to road sensors, will talk to stoplights about traffic efficiency. The ambulance will talk to patient records, will talk to doctors about saving lives. It's going to be amazing and exciting, and maybe, most remarkably, not that far away. Okay. So that's Cisco, right? Cisco, router, company, mm -hmm. community, and everything. Right, because they realize the connectivity. Right, if you do a value chain analysis, you're not even in the front end of the value chain. Right, the front end of the value chain is the guy who's got the application. The front end of the value chain is the person who can use the analytics that are coming from that. But Cisco says, "Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we have to figure out. We have the interconnectivity. We want to figure out how to do it and do it, do it better." Right, but it's fascinating. If you listen to their analyst reports. This is all over their analyst reports. They are positioning them as the central infrastructure player in IOE, the Internet of Everything, or IoT, the Internet of Things. We're going to talk about some, some use cases in this area. This is going to put companies out of business who can't adapt to that. It's going to change everyone in the room, right? Because we will do different types of monitoring which is going to affect health care, which is going to affect potentially how people price life insurance policies, mm -hmm. and lots of other things. Okay. That's all. Right. S, social media has changed the way we interact, share, and communicate information. So first of all, they call it social media, and we're in Boston, which is probably the second largest BC environment after the Valley, right? What's the third largest area for capital investment in social media? Boston. Not Boston. Austin. Austin. Boston, not Austin. New York. New York. Eat New York. New York, which was dead in the internet. Which one day you went know, clear, boom. You had to pop them up off the table, right? It's media. And so what New York has done is said, we own the media part of the social media. We're trying to understand, understand that, that whole business of how do we begin leveraging that in the media because it's going to fundamentally change an ad buy, which is they, they, they skim. Like you have a 23-year-old that comes up and says, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you how to place your Kentucky Fried Chicken ads, right? They get, for that billion dollar placement, they get, you know, 4% placement fee. They drive a lot of revenue by placing ads, right? That's going to all change. How do we leverage things like social media? I look at my 11-year-old or I look at my 16-year-old, they're not looking at media. 
in the traditional way, print, television, to figure out what they're going to do. My gosh, they, they look at YouTube, right? They look at their friends. They figure out, hey, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm 16, I'm going to be you know, driving and stuff. What do you do for insurance? My dad wants to charge me. That's pretty bad. So, lots of firms. <laughs> That's all right. Most people didn't get it. It's all right. You're good. You're good. <laughs> so, the, um, so, if you look at all of these firms that have been funded, which are coming out of Boston, they're coming out of Austin, they're coming out of New York, they're coming out of the Valley, they're all coming in trying to get their hands around what this new world is looking like and how to communicate. So, we pulled another video, and again, our purpose during the video is really to underscore this point, which is this is all around us. So, so let's start with a video. I think that can magic can happen. See? So this past weekend, uh, he and, uh, and some of his friends have been getting into, uh, well, first of all, they're very into music, but, but they've been looking at sneakers. I'm like, I, I had PF Flyer, and I had Converse, I had, you know, like I had like the same style of basketball sneaker. Nike. Nike, whatever. So Nike is coming out with um, limited release sneakers. Did, did people? <laughs> People track, I mean, is that? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. When my son explained, that's why. He said, Dad, you don't know anything. 
right? I'm like, how did I get there? Mm -hmm. So, and, and by the way, my favorite thing was when he came up to me. Um, so we're a funny household. Uh, we don't allow uh, television or cable in our household. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, and, and and my son turned to me and he goes, Dad, you know nothing about technology. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> how old is he? Um, he's 16. I go, I, I, I go some, you know, sometime you'll do it. So anyway, Nike is coming out with limited edition sneakers. But they come out with them, they show up in the store, boom, they sell out, and then they show up on eBay. And so, you know, someone buys them for, okay, now, by the way, my most expensive pair of sneakers that I, I bought, like even an adult, is probably like 60 bucks. And, and they're like talking about $250 for sneakers. And I'm like, hey, listen, it's your money. He goes, Dad, can I borrow your PayPal? I go, yeah. But, <laughs> but it's, he goes, he goes 250 bucks. And I go, okay. So I said, so what's your idea? He goes, well, Dad, look, they, someone buys these sneakers and they go up on eBay for like 350 bucks. Hmm. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah. And I go, I, okay, okay. I get, this is a parent teaching moment, uh, supply, demand. You know, here's how things go. He goes, Dad, um, actually, let me explain something to you. I go, what's that? He goes, well, I teamed up with one of my classmates who's great at programming. And I go, and I, I've looked at this, and I've realized there's an opportunity here. And I go, what's that? And he goes, okay, well, you're going to be the bank. And I go, okay. <laughs> I've been that for a while. I go, well, so how did, how did this work? He goes, well, he goes, I'm the guy who's kind of putting this all together. And I'm going, okay, what are you putting together? He goes, well, Nike announces the release of this sneaker via Twitter. I go, yeah. So he goes, I've convinced my buddy who's a programmer to write a script that when it comes out of Twitter, he pulls the feed and we pre-populate on the Nike website going into the, into the uh, procurement system to buy a set of sneakers. Because he goes, when it shows up and they announce it, he goes, they're sold out in, the, in, a, in a second. So we have built an interface between the Twitter feed and populating a store on Nike. So I had to go into the store, which I never bought on Nike, went in, put my credit card, everything, you know, uh, launch that up. Um, I said, okay, okay, explain to me again how this is gonna work. He goes, the Twitter feed comes up, we grab it, we have the code, we shoot it out, it sets off a bot, it pre-populates, going in, to an engine, and we go into the next door, and we can buy a thing like that. And I go, where does it run? He goes, well, <clears throat> um, we had to run it. Dad, do, do you know what AWS is? <laughs> I go, uh, you just uh, help me out. Like, what's AWS? He goes, Dad, we're running it in the cloud. We're running it in Amazon using their servers. Because, you know, we don't, you know, I'm not sure that our server in our house is going to be fast enough, and, I, and sometimes we lose internet access because we're relocated. And he goes, I, I don't want to lose this opportunity. I go, okay, this is good. You're running it in AWS, you're writing, you're writing a script, it's pulling the thing, you get the Twitter, you pop it. I go, if you ever wonder what I do, it's that. <laughs> okay, that, that's what I do. He's like, look at me, I go, yeah, that's good. I go, how many are you going to do it? He goes, well, how much money do you have? <laughs> and I said, Okay, you can buy two pairs of sneakers. <laughs> All right? He bought two <laughs> pairs of sneakers. He made $500 this weekend. He's 16 years old. Okay? It pulled it off of Twitter, grabbed it, ran it, pre-populated it, hit Nike, boom, they bought two. And I said, by the way, when you buy it, make sure you put down, like, a common size. So it better be between 9 and 12. <laughs> right? <clears throat> because that's what you want to do. They got the sneakers, got delivered. He had it already sold. Because he didn't have to go on eBay. Why didn't he go on eBay? He didn't go on eBay because they charge a percentage of the transaction. Absolutely. Right? So what did he do? There's a thing on Facebook where people trade sneakers and you can put up things and he posted a pair and he had it pre-sold. And I'm like, okay, that's vertical integration. Horizontal communication. Siloed systems. I'm thinking, that's pretty good. You know? I'm like, okay. You know, it's good. My wife thinks that's the worst thing that ever happened. <laughs> she goes, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're fostering his buying, like, you know, a, uh, a trendy item. She goes, that's terrible. And I said, I said, you know, listen, you, you know, you made money, things are paying for college. Okay, so, that, so that's the next one. I just want to know, did you give him your credit card? Uh, I, I had pre-done it. 
I, I had. Um, uh, but I how had, did they secure it through AWS and the interface? To I'm just curious. Um, uh, because uh, what it did is it triggered. I already had pre. It was already preloaded into the Nike store, so it actually so it set like off a bot trigger. that was ready to hit the enter. Essentially, it was it was digitally so hitting the enter button. It, it saved the account. Right information. So, so my kind of information wasn't in AWS. It was in the Nike store. Uh, understood. I just want to understand how he thought about security of... He didn't. He didn't. That's what I was getting at. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just wanted to ask. He did. But we do have, a, we do have I, we do, and I strongly advise everybody to have your internet only credit card. Mm -hmm. Well, not only that, but you also can do the, 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 the short-term credit card. Like Citibank will give you a... a card that links to your card, but you can only use it at one-time use. Sure, your throwdown credit card. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He's so only it's right away. Right. And just thinking about it. I now, can't believe you limited it to two. <laughs> yeah. This is a great arbitrage opportunity. What were you waiting for? That's college. Okay. Yeah. yeah, which, by the way, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Um, mobile has enabled Interest can be accessed anytime, anywhere. We don't. We, now we all know that, right? So we don't have to see a video on that. Now let's talk about analytics. So this is a this is a client. This is like in a in a in a knock, right? This is a utilities company. They're trying to watch everything going through and stuff like that. The, the by the way, the utility infrastructure in the United States makes the insurance infrastructure look modern. Mm -hmm. Okay, like we should all be frightened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we should all be frightened about what happens with our, with, with like, like with the infrastructure and the utility industry. Because they're not the fastest moving people on the planet, right? You know, you aren't rewarded for being an innovator in that environment. Challenge for us, how do you create an environment of safe innovation, right? So, hey, you can innovate but not get fired. Let's talk about analytics. So, <clears throat> here's a short little vid on, on analytics.
big data analysts, remember, I, st I started an MPP. Right? I started with thinking machines. I remember like, people were getting excited over like Prey and Teradata and all that kind of stuff. Like, the, uh, the, we built one of the first unstructured analysis engines to find uh, the Unibomber. Right? You know, like, like, like that was one of the first you know, like, like projects. Oh my gosh, you could like, uh, scan you know, notes from an FBI file and throw them into a database and figure out how to read you know, like different forms and, and voice conversations. Now with the word, world being digitized, right? I, I was freaked only because of the reality of Snowden. I mean, like, we should all be somewhat freaked like, by that because, like, that's freaky. Like, it's, d d w okay, maybe it's just me. Who was freaked out by Snowden, that whole thing with uh, the NSA? Am, am I the only one? No, freaked out. She, well, freaked she, out. Unless you were paranoid ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I remember when Echelon took off. I was like, oh, this is really bad. It looks like the NSA is leading a big global opportunity to snoop on trying to be people. Ah, that's Tim Paul that stuff. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Tim Paul, I mean, they, you know, they, they, there, was a, there was a thing with, um, there was a movie where, where, uh, where a guy was like, thought he was being followed and stuff. And he had to go inside a Faraday cage so that uh, you know he was uh, to avoid electronic signal interception. Like it was, it was like, I'm trying to remember the actor. Gene Hackman was in the movie. Does anybody remember? Oh, Enemy of the State. Enemy of the State. The guy, the guy goes into a Faraday cage. Is that why you wear an aluminum foil hat? You know. It was like the only time I've ever seen a Faraday cage in in, uh, in, in a movie. But I was like saying, oh, okay, I get that. But like, oh my gosh, the level of like the, the intrusiveness, and is it good? Is it bad? What are the ethical, moral, like, where are we going? What's the extension so, of that? Well, what do you think people are upset about? It? I mean, what do you think we're aren't or are? Are not. We're totally okay with this. I mean, the only people who are upset are librarians and the EFF. I think <laughs> we are all okay with it. I mean, is it is it because there's no alternatives? Because there's no political traction for it? I mean. You can't, I mean, people aren't leaving Google in droves. I mean, there's, there's a search engine DuckDuckGo, which is an alternative, and 12 of us use it. I mean, <laughs> or do we just, is this just simply the new normal? Yeah. Right? It's the same so reason normal. people would give their can passwords away for a candy bar. Right. Right. But we're not even getting candy. <laughs> we're not <laughs> getting candy. We're, we're exposing our lives. I mean, it's right. right. I mean, so we're, we're used to doing this already, so there's no, I think, I think it is hypnosis. Right. Well, if it's hypnosis, it's, it's, it's not hypnotizing people over 55. I mean, those are 10 Oh, no, no. So how come, they're not, how come we're not seeing ARP go to war against the NSA? I'm, I'm quite serious about this. I mean, I mean, a 15 year old, 30 year old me, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be like, you know, like you, I'm happy to have my nudity exposed to the web, right? But people over 55 <laughs> tend not to be using mobile. I actually didn't say that. <laughs> Why, you know, how come these guys aren't? It's a step further. Yeah. I mean, World War II guys, right, they knocked down the barriers around World War II Memorial in Washington last week. Huh? How, come they're not, how come they're not celebrating Snowden? Is this just too alien? I mean, I'm not being sarcastic. This no, but, 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 you know, these, yeah. are, these are good conversations to have. Because all of the stuff, the ability to get access to data and get it in person and do stuff, when the world's become digital, right? Is nothing private. Yeah, nothing private. So, 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 Josh and I had a dinner in New York last week with uh, somebody from one of the largest Wait. banks in the world, and they have credit card information on a huge amount of people in the world. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, uh, when somebody applies for a uh, any type of loan, they go ten layers deep on who's the supplier. These people, so they they've got huge amounts of data. They're taking that data and they're trying to figure out how to build a five billion dollar business selling that data. Mm -hmm. I think it's the new norm. I mean, they're going to take your credit card data and 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 everything around it, and people are going to understand that. Okay, on Facebook it says that you know I love motorcycles, so the advertisers on Facebook are going to try and sell you a motorcycle. What they don't realize is that that person hasn't bought anything regarding motorcycle in 15 years. And they're buying baby carriages and a whole bunch of other stuff, mm -hmm. right? So there's another level of data. Everything's changing, and I, uh, you can, I can editorialize it or not, but it's the new norm. I think people are just, that data's out there, and, um, and the people over 55 or 60 or the World War II guys, mm -hmm. you know, you know they, they don't let their wallet out of their pocket, and it's, Everybody in between has kind of accepted it as the new norm, in, in, in my opinion, whether that's right or wrong. It's, 
and, 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 and partly, you know, it's the, it's the canary, you know, like, right. you know, like, like, like different people are going to respond to it. But the fact is, the, you know, it, it's the same thing. Why do people keep building properties along the coast? Yet, then, that maybe they want to build a little bit inland, right? Because that's where the coast is going to be. But, but just, okay, so, just, just one other thing to it, and how people will give up data. So we're working with Lockheed Martin, who worked with DARPA and the D Defense mm -hmm. Department, and they, they built a, this huge um, uh, database and search engine and analytics to pull together information uh, on 138 countries. And it's looking at countries. Uh, countries. Mm -hmm. Looking at news media, social media, all, it's all on 6,000 data feeds. 6,000 data feeds, right, every day. And they're looking at uh, 50,000 what they call actors that they're tracking. And it's everything from commodities to religious mm. trends to all this stuff. Mm. And uh, we're helping them commercialize. Mm -hmm. But it's taking and all in um, uh, 67, 67, yeah, languages, yeah, yeah. 67 languages translated and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So it's what I think investment officers are going to look at mm -hmm. to, to look at world trends and help do that kind of stuff. So it's. It's you know it's all that unstructured data being pulled together and nothing's private anymore. Everything's well, I mean, it, 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 it's to, to, to predict what's going to happen. You're talking about a simulation, or are you talking about? No, no, no. I'm talking about data. Yeah, like, like that's a forecasting. It's capable of that's forecasting I mean. everything from interest rate yeah. shifts to violence in a country. Now, that's that's a simulation. You can just you can that's just right, pull right. data. You can just yeah, you know, hit play. Yes. Right, see what happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Financial yeah. services yeah. primarily could use it. Mm -hmm. Think about if you had a global supply chain mm -hmm. and understood mm -hmm. potentially forecasting events that could affect mm -hmm. the linear process. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so you know, I think we clearly have to move on. But this is what this this is what the whole two days is about. This is what I would check before I got up and use the But to answer your question, <laughs> listen. To me, there's two <laughs> things going on here. There's there's data so that we can all in our businesses yeah. do what we do. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully. We're not talking, you know, banks are there to be banks and businesses are there to sell you things. And overall, they shouldn't poison you and kill you. The fear for me, having worked for government, isn't about the business side. I mean, that hopefully we have some bit of, you know, um, we have a model to stop things and start things and things don't work. It's called kind of capitalism. It's the government that's here more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So it really is the Snowden, the NSA. Mm -hmm. It's so, you know, we can have multiple conversations. Today isn't really about, you know, uh, I smack and what it means to the government, but that's what really scares me. I think what you just described is the new culture war. Who would you be afraid of? Yeah. Would you be afraid of NSA or would you be afraid of Reebok? Uh, yeah, so again, obviously I'm not sure how it fits in, you know, because um, we all have businesses and the purpose of this is to have conversations about what does it mean to us. But you know, whether it's good or bad, the fact of the matter is, is that we are living in this, I call it liquid data. You know, the other interesting thing is, is that we're dealing also with the nature of analytics here. It's not like he talks about an insurance form, mm -hmm. okay? We, we all fill it out, like 25 pieces of data. Now think about that. I mean, it's like it's bullshit data. And then somehow I got an insurance premium. Mm -hmm. What's liquid data? Uh, sensors coming in real time telling me how well I really drive or the Nike bracelet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we don't even know what the hell I'm going to do with that. So the opportunity, I think, that we have to talk about here, it, getting out of the negative, is that this is an incredible time. Mm -hmm. there, we don't have a clue, an absolute clue, how to connect the dots between that data and what it really means. So, so I, th I think we turn it over to Jonathan. Yeah, sorry. Right. But, but, but by the way, the whole idea, yeah, I mean, the whole idea, it's disruptive. Where the boundaries yeah. are, we don't know. That's what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Sorry. Sorry. I just want to ask a question of the group, because I don't know. Is there a hierarchy of data quality? I mean, we're talking about it's yeah. one thing to record an observable thing. It is something altogether different to fill out forms mm -hmm. and for people to self-report and for us to build analytical models off of and decision-making off of things that are a mess, let's exactly. face it. I mean, if you go into, and, from, and, and the quality of data that is collected from when people are little and mm -hmm. all the way along the pipeline is really, really not reliable. Yeah. So that's a huge, I mean. Wait, wait, you, there are a lot of IT yeah. people in this room and they've been paying a bag of money to Gartner for bad data <laughs> forever. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> that's why you start using it and it becomes reliable because you yeah. use it. That's how it becomes reliable. You right, right. use it, and you use it, you use it. <laughs> Sandy Penland has a story about, he's with MIT, about uh, some uh, Ivory Coast of Africa project where they were collecting 
data through people's mobile devices about illnesses. And they were trying to track viruses so that they could catch them and stop them. And as a side of this, then this is data that's the unstructured data that's the data that you're not even filling out a form and collecting, it's just there. They found all this transportation data, and they changed all the mm -hmm. bus routes. Mm -hmm. So there's whoever said that we don't know. This is the beginning of. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing what we can do. And then there's the government, and nobody mentioned hackers yet. I mean, there's all right. kinds of. Whenever you have things like this, you have these threats and these new things that are coming in. So you can look at it as really exciting, or you can look at it as oh, really scary. I think or it's both. very exciting. I just I think you know have we ever? I don't know. Are there echelons of data? I mean, oh, of you course know, right. I mean, yeah, I mean, in terms of recording the, but really thinking hard about that and the way that we engage people and, 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 and try to educate them. And I will tell you right now, half the people in this room subsidize the other half who, um, half the people in this room report accurately, the other half in this room underreport. Like, like, I, like I guarantee you, right? Because no one's safe. No one. <laughs> right? So, so, so you know, here's a classic, right? Here's a classic. And, and, and what we'll use the thing, but I'm going to talk about insurance because I, I have a love affair going on with it lately, which is uh, uh, the how many miles do you drive? Mm -hmm. How many miles do you drive? When, when you report it and you're, you know, you're doing your annual renewal. And it's <laughs> how, close oh, home. Huh? how close to home? How close are you to home? I, my, my, my office is next to Starbucks. <laughs> so I only drive to my house to Starbucks, right? You know, and, you, I mean, like, that it's one of the huge underreported data. But you don't need to ask anymore. Yeah. It'll, it'll be all collected in the devices. No, I've got the, oh, it's, what's the GPS. service? Yes. Man, that was a punchline. That's kind of a good thing. <laughs> no, 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 I have a better Sorry. One. Okay. So now we go to cloud. But everybody gets a cloud. I don't have to explain this cloud, so I'm going to skip a right. video on it. But everybody gets a cloud, right? The cloud is a giant enabler. And the fact that a 16-year-old is figuring out how to access a server in AWS just like I, like I just love it, I right? So to what's going to happen? And, and I think, by the way, you know, Amazon's one of the most exciting companies to watch on the planet mm -hmm. right now. Just you know, unless you're a retailer, the, the, well, it is exciting the, 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 because because what, because it's there's a, a right level now. of unpredictably uh, unpredictability in their behavior, mm -hmm. which I which I appreciate. Like I love you know like variables which pop out from the side and change an equation, right? So Amazon is doing some things which aren't necessarily linear. Which is great, which is worth watching. Okay, so we don't have to watch that. So <clears throat> there's lots of uh, technology which is disruptive, but I am going to talk about usage based car insurance. Usage based car insurance. So, UBI. <laughs> How many people have heard of UBI, usage based insurance? Oh. Rate suffers. But I like it. They're with a commercial. <laughs> right? Yeah, they're rate suffers. The By the way, Progressive, which got a process patent mm -hmm. on UBI, which has kind of elbowed out the market, we've just, uh, Return on Intelligence, we just filed a counter pa uh, patent, mm. right? Uh, yeah, changing the model. Now, here's the thing that pisses me off about the behavior of, of Progressive. First of all, it's a process patent, which is like bogus. Like, do me a favor, do invention, show me you have a brain. Let me see a synaptic thing as opposed to. I'm kind of like reusing it to do something which we've always done, which is <coughs> rate making. They've always done rate making. They're just saying, I've used a new variable in rate making. So I'm going to patent that. Like, do me a favor, show you have a brain. But progressive doesn't impress me. Because what they've done is <coughs> they are an NSA writer. Right? They write, they started by writing non-standard auto. Non-standard auto is the dregs of the auto business. But it's also the ability, because no one here is non-standard auto. What is non-standard auto? Non-standard auto is, is uh, you, you don't have a credit score. You're, you have a DWI. You've had too many things. You, you, you can't do it. You, you, you qualify. High you risk. Qualify. High risk. High risk. So Subprime. Subprime. Subprime, right? But people make a ton of money off of non-standard auto, and Progressive was able to build their business into, in, into standard auto by, by leveraging it. And then what they've been doing is they've been giving these little devices that people put in the car yep. because what they're doing is they're collecting mileage. Because the history of rate making in insurance carriers, a bunch of people who are actuarials who you never invite to a dinner party <laughs> because they're sitting there and they're looking at past data because what they're imagining is if I have enough data that I've collected in the past, I can figure out a use case for every individual combination of age, car, household, and all that kind of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. However, everybody in this room is subsidizing Bad drivers. Yeah. 
Everybody in this room is subsidizing bad drivers. Let me give you an example of a client we have. A client we have is a small province in Canada. We are fitting them with devices, UBI devices, that go on a motorcycle. Hmm. Because what happened in that Canada is a lot of people, in that province, a lot of people drive motorcycles. 2G radius. Right? <laughs> like, like 2G radius. They, 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 they drive motorcycles. And 